Hi everyone, it's Dr. Romani. Welcome to tonight's live. The one thing I can tell you that's good is it's gonna be a little bit shorter than usual because in 45 minutes I have to be somewhere. So I thought we were trying to wedge it into this little space here before it got too too late um, and I have to make it a very early flight in the morning and go to bed and all those lovely things. So welcome, welcome to our Saturday live. Um, I've been listening to all kinds of fascinating lectures on on trauma and grief and, you know, trying to learn how to, you know, take all that and bring it into our world of understanding narcissistic relationships and narcissistic abuse. But I have to say, I spoke to a full room of hundreds and hundreds of therapists, all of whom are talking about how they're seeing this in their clients, how clients are needing a framework. But the thing I'm hearing that really made me feel hopeful and better is that many of their clients are getting better. So I think it's just important for anyone who's a survivor to hear that as much as it feels like it's just this difficult, forever, awful. Even one woman was talking about uh, um, the case that her she has uh, many clients who can't leave their relationships for cultural reasons, and yet they're still able to come out of that and create these really authentic kinds of real spaces. So I just I'm just saying that because I don't think we often talk. We're always talking about the struggle, but there's also a lot of hope in all of this too. And there was also a great line I heard. I wanted to have to bring up this document because I typed it literally thinking about this live and what was it he had said? It was so good. Let me see if I can find it. Um, ah, and I'm going to tr try to make this into a YouTube video too, is that the mind will always want, the mind would rather feel guilty than helpless. As long as there's something we can do, it's easier for us. And I think that has so much app applicability to the experience of narcissistic abuse that the mind, it's easier for the mind to feel guilty than helpless, right? And that's so much of what narcissistic abuse is about, that we feel guilty in these relationships. Did I do the same wrong thing? Did I say the wrong thing? Am I bad for thinking this? But the alternative is seeing the relationship clearly for what it is. In fact, one of the things I talked about today is how do we help someone get to a point where they feel safe enough to see what the relationship is about? Because to see it means like, oh, shoot, like this isn't really going to change and all the ick of radical acceptance. But again, that the mind in some ways finds more comfort in feeling guilty because guilty is better than helpless. And I think that that really captured a real core conflict for folks who are in narcissistic relationships because that helplessness, that there's nothing you can do. It can take a while to get to that place of sort of radical acceptance. A couple of things. I'm going to answer questions today. It'll only be about 15 minutes. Hit some of the topics we shared yesterday. And then oh, I'll obviously highlight that I guess in the East Coast, it's about another five hours and or so. Those of you on the West Coast have about another eight hours. And in other time zones, I think we've already timed you out. But in the rest of the country, however, for many day hours you have left. But by midnight tonight, you order a hard copy, hot copy or an ebook and verify by the end of the day, you will get access to the six hour live virtual retreat. Um, and again, that is something that once the book isn't doing all these fancy things it's doing, we're going to, we're going to stop doing this in such an intense way. We keep the raffle going for as long as this is all happening. And that's a 30 minute tea with Dr. Romney. We have another five of those we're going to auction, I mean, auction raffle off. Um, and those are, um, and those are just sort of a chance to have a private Zoom conversation with me, ask me some questions. And then we're also raffling off sign books and book boxes and all that good stuff. So all that's all that you can um, and other prizes too. So any any books you purchase, those are all getting you raffle entries. I'm sort of it was sort of exciting. We had a book event tonight here where I am, and that all of the books sold out, which was actually pretty exciting that so many people were getting their hands on it and they got to meet some wonderful people. So I'm very happy about that. And again, if you want to get at a discount, 30% off on Amazon, these folks weren't getting that discount. So take advantage of that. So let me go ahead to the topics we had, um, we have to cover. And again, all this stuff, you have to verify your purchase. You can verify it either in the link in the Instagram bio, or you can verify using the, um, the link in uh, the YouTube video description. Okay. However you're watching this. So a couple of the things that you had asked about, again, I'm being so mindful that I make sure I don't leave off the topics from the last time, but also get to these other topics that came up. So we only have 15 minutes, but I'll file these away. And even if we don't get to do lives next week, because the book did its whole fancy thing, we'll start those lives up again once I catch my breath, I promise you. So I'll, I'll keep these papers with me. One of the things that 
was asked about was this concept of narcissistic fleas. And I wanted to talk a little bit about that for those of you who may not be familiar with this concept. In my book from 2019, Don't You Know Who I Am? I wrote about this as infectious narcissism. But this idea that sort of some of these narcissistic patterns like fleas can jump on you from the narcissistic person. That if you spend enough time in proximity to a narcissistic person, whether it's a family member, whether it's a partner, certainly even someone you work with, that some of these behaviors, patterns, habits will kind of, again, infect you by being close to them. The only form of truth there is in that is that you're not going to become narcissistic. Let me just reassure you that if you're a grown adult and you meet a narcissistic person, you're not going to become narcissistic. But what can happen is these relationships are pure survivalism, front to back. That's what they are. And in that survivalism, you're not, and, and because you're getting no empathy, because stuff like behaving in a civil manner and a, a nice manner doesn't matter, what ends up happening is that you might find yourself becoming even more abrupt in your communication, especially if you're primarily interacting with a narcissistic person. So for example, if you're in a marriage or a committed relationship with them and you work at home and they're one of your primary social contacts, you can start almost taking on some of their communication style because it's the main thing you're around. Same thing in a workplace. We're at work, what, eight to 10 to 12 hours a day. We could pick up those patterns. That's that idea of narcissistic fleas. Because after a while you feel you can't even, you can't communicate like a warm, nice person. You almost have to be a sort of the way they are. And that can feel like that. But it doesn't mean you are that. And you might even notice you have sort of two ways of behaving. There's the abrupt you that's with the narcissistic person and there's a warmer you that can come out with healthier people and sadly those kind of two separate yous evolve hopefully you have that one place that that more authentic you you can be can exist can be seen but then you sort of create this more hopefully not that narcissistic flea version of you it's almost more of a detached disengaged but it still doesn't feel good it doesn't feel like who you are so that's a lot of what that um what the narcissistic leak um, concept is. Someone else asked about this idea of the narcissistic cover-up. That's what they said as the topic. I'm going to tell you how I interpreted it, and hopefully I don't even know if that person's here this evening because it was from a couple of days ago. I believe that one way to think of the narcissistic cover-up is how the enablers or others in a system, like a family system or something like that, will attempt to sort of um, almost... <laughs> It's like almost sort of soft pedal on the narcissistic person's behavior, just sort of like eh, not address it, ignore it, pretend it's not happening, enable it. That's what those narcissistic cover-ups look like. It's it, it, What they're kind of doing is they're almost willing to be the grandiosity for the narcissistic person, make the public excuses. Everything's fine. Nothing to see here. We're all very happy. No problems here. This at the most severe end, if a narcissistic person is a significant abuse perpetrator in a family, the narcissistic cover-up is very much a place where a um, where what we might see is that literally the abuse is denied. And so the person who experienced abuse in that family system fear, fear, feels re-traumatized because their experience is actually their experience of abuse is literally being denied. Um, then, again, if you think I could read my freaking writing... Um, uh, and then uh, I'm going to jump to this, which is this idea of um, narcissistic sensitivity. This, and this kind of relates to a topic from the other day too, which is this idea of self-victimization. Narcissistic people, the best way to think of it is that they're very thin-skinned. And as a result, they're very provocable, which is why something very small, even like a good-natured jab or a good-natured joke, that they could do that to you. And if you were to react, they'd make a whole gaslighty big deal of how sensitive you are. But even if you do something good natured or funny or just sort of laugh, like, I don't know, maybe they left like milk on their lip or something, their thin skinness can mean that they're very, very sensitive at those times and very, very reactive. The thin skinned quality of narcissism is a universal, grandiose, malignant, um, vulnerable, it doesn't matter. It's probably most pronounced in the vulnerable narcissistic folks where shame is much more of a dynamic where they'll be very reactive or be very silent, treat many or passive aggressive or withdraw or withhold when they sort of feel that sense of provocation. But with a malignant narcissistic person, it might be that re very reactive, scary, menacing rage. With a grandiose person, it could be really some clap back and some, you know, sort of 
they're going to do you as badly as you. They're going to come push back at you and say meaner things to you. So it's the kind of thing where this is where the eggshells come from. The narcissistic person will also engage in all this self-victimization. That Remember, we talk about DARVO, deny, that when, when you approach a narcissistic person with something that they've done, they will deny it, then they will attack you, and then they will reverse a victim and offender, even though you're the one who's harmed. By the time it's done, they'll put themselves in the position of victim and make it seem as though you're the offender. And depending on what kind of system you're in, other people may buy into that. So a great example where you can see that play out Forgiveness is a great example of that, right? So you may, they may have done something wrong. They may have betrayed you. You may push back on them. They will deny it. Then they will attack you, okay? Saying that, how dare you? I didn't do that. You're a terrible person. And then they will reverse victim and offender and say, you know, I'm the one who's suffering. You're a terrible person. And then when you get into that whole forgiveness swamp, Something that came up a lot in the conversations here, and I might even have mentioned it on these lives, I sometimes forget, is that the person who doesn't do the forgiving is the problem, right? So the whole focus is on you not forgiving, and it's almost like the bad behavior gets forgotten. It's another sort of reversing victim and offender. So that self-victimization is a way the narcissistic person can get um, get supply, they can, um, they'll get your pity and guilt, they'll often get a free pass, they truly believe they're the victim, enablers may support them. It might be the idea that you're the bad person. If you have self-blame and self-doubt, you might really believe you're the bad person. And those of you, for example, a great example would be a narcissistic parent who will say to you, oh my gosh, you're, you, I did so much for you. You don't even appreciate me. You're so ungrateful. You're so selfish. But actually, you're an adult who's individuated, which is what normal development would say. But the self-victimization is, I did so much for you, which is ridiculous because when you have a kid, you do stuff for them. That's sort of the deal you're getting into, but they make it sound as though this is supposed to be a quid pro quo. I'm your parent and I did this, so you owe me something back. So apparently they didn't read that part in the parenting handbook. So those are those issues around narcissistic sensitivity, as well as that sort of sense of narcissistic um, uh, victimization. And this leads us to that point about the... Um, the smear campaign in, in families, right? So smear campaigns happen all the time in families, especially families who view the person, especially the person who's being narcissistically abused saying, yo, 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 everyone, this is not okay. I'm not coming to this family event. I'm not doing this. I'm not playing this game sort of thing. Well, then you're the problem because you're upsetting the apple cart. And if you do that enough or you really try to set a more permanent boundary, like I'm not coming when that person's there, that is when that family it's easier to sort of demonize you, view them as being okay, including the, per the narcissist, the person who's behaving narcissistically or harmfully. And then it'll make, they'll even prop that up further by saying terrible things about you. And they may not even be true. And this again can be devastating. It's may not be surprising if this is the kind of family system you're used to being in, but it's definitely can be devastating when you feel family members you once trusted or once cared about or even the ones that are part of the smear campaign. That's the worst part of smear campaigns. You're not surprised that the narcissistic person's doing a smear campaign kind of thing. What you're surprised and hurt by is people who you thought were allies, who were friends, who were people you cared about, who you thought kind of got it and got you when they're piling on. And that grief can feel like a massive setback and also really push those buttons of self-doubt and self-blame. And then someone else also asked a question about narcissism versus psychopathy yesterday. They're highly related and they're highly correlated, but they're also significantly different. Psychopathy is, we see a much more cool, calculated, superficially intelligent, charming person who above all else doesn't have a lot of nervous system reactivity. They don't really get anxious. When you don't get anxious, it's easier to do terrible things. And on top of not feeling anxious, they also don't feel remorse. Where a narcissistic person might actually still feel guilt and shame, but when they feel guilt, they rage at someone, but still they feel guilt. The psychopathic person doesn't feel those things. So the level at which a psychopathic person can do bad things in a relationship, lie, cheat, behave violently, steal, 
um, have a different identity, start a different family. That is going to happen more naturally with a psychopathic person because they're not sort of stumbling sort of with all that shame and, and guilt. I know you can't believe that narcissistic people feel guilt, but they do. It just comes out as rage. For the psychopathic people, they don't feel that. So you don't see as much of that in your face rage. It's kind of a menacing, cold, exacting, almost clinical rage. Like they're going to plan how they're going to get their revenge on you. So sometimes psychopathic people aren't as reactive. There, again, there's a lot of overlap, but once you bring that lack of remorse and that different kind of autonomic nervous system sensitivity, that's where the psycho psychopathy kind of veers off in a very different direction. And again, a lot more of that parasitic lifestyle, willingness to do things like that, like use aliases. There's almost more of what would translate more naturally into a criminality. With a narcissistic person, much as they don't think about consequences, a psychopathic person definitely doesn't think about consequences. That's why they tend to do a lot more short-term plays, like short-term crimes. They'll, they'll go move someplace else, quickly take on a new kind of an identity and just sort of do their scam someplace else. And a narcissistic person, it doesn't translate in that way as much. It's a little bit more... I mean, a, a relationship with a psychopathic person is terrifying. I, a, a relationship with a narcissistic person is harmful. Terrifying, we typically wouldn't use that word. And so if you're in that relationship where that's at that level of level of terror, now you're in the more psychopathic realm, which is much more rare. Doesn't mean it doesn't happen, but it is more rare. And you might be watching the narcissism content and thinking like, why does my situation feel a little different? It is going to feel a little different if you're with someone psychopathic. So let's jump into some questions here. If anybody has them, please jump in. There you are, Cat Sushi. You have been here at the lives. So you combine two things I love, sushi and cat. So welcome back. I, I see your name all the time. So thank you for being such a such a an earnest participant and, and consistent participant. I'm very grateful for you. So what are the effects on students who experience narcissistic abuse from their teachers? Thanks for asking that question because one of the questions here on the topic list was narcissism and academia. So it's going to give me a chance to sort of build off on both of those. I think the effects are quite terrible because a, a teacher relationship is meant to be a trusting relationship. A teacher is almost in a somewhat parental role where they are, that the, student is that the that the teacher should be in a protective role they should be creating psychological safety that they're not meant to be getting their needs met from the student but their role is to teach the student and a student who is chronically invalidated by a teacher especially if it's a significant teacher a teacher they've had repeatedly or if they only have one teacher a teacher they see all day or a teacher that is teaching something that's very core to what they need to learn we see a lot of the usual effects of narcissistic abuse. Am I dumb? I'm not a good enough student. Maybe I shouldn't be studying this. I'm not trying hard enough. And narcissistic teachers can do things like very much play favorites, engage in some, engage in some forms of triangulation, give up on students. Those are the kinds of things we would see and, and sort of be very put upon by the whole enterprise so it's, it is harmful. And I think if, especially if a younger child had a narcissistic teacher, that's, that's a harmful state because usually the child has one teacher all day. And I don't know why that person would be a teacher, but these people, narcissistic people do become teachers. Someone asked, the, asked for that topic of narcissism and academia. Academia, usually we mean more like higher education, like at the university level. And there's lots of narcissism there. Interestingly, the stakes may not be that high, but there is definitely this sense of there's a lot of gaslighting in higher education. And there's there's a lot of, you know, again, triangulation you might see sometimes in higher education, but it's definitely there. And the problem is, is that a university professor might have undergraduate students that report to them, graduate students that report to them. And because of that amount of power and the number of people that might be under them, if they're very narcissistic, they could definitely do harm to those students in the same way, leaving them self-blaming, self-doubting, um, feeling as though they're not good enough. And if that's at all a, a repetition of something that's happening in a family system, it's so sad because it could take someone with real talent and sort of pull them out of the game of thinking they're not smart enough to be here. Thank you again, Kat Sushi, for always being here too. Other questions? Um, hi, Dr. Do restraining orders work to make narcissistic people leave you alone? Their harassment is really bad. This is a tough one to answer. Restraining orders are tricky, right? What we got to remember about restraining orders is that they're a legal piece of paper that allows law enforcement to 
have greater leeway. Basically, it allows law enforcement to kind of break away from some standard constitutional elements in terms of being like, we can't typically arrest someone because they're near us. If all they're doing is coming near us, that's not a, that is not an arrestable condition unless there is a restraining order. So that's what I'm saying. It's like, it's a, it's a violation of sort of fundamental civil rights in our country. So when a person, it, and so in order to get a restraining order, the bar is not, it's higher than you think in terms of the documentation you need, the proof you need, the whole steps you need to go through, then the person getting the restraining order has to be identified, right? They have to be told, I'm sure they have to be told, they have to be served. So it's not like you just put on a restraining order and you're living your life and then you can say, hey, I have this, you call the police and they're near me. The person you're getting the restraining order is told that they have a restraining order on them. And once that's given to them by a process server or law enforcement, it inflames the narcissistic person who, because narcissistic people are oppositional, they're often, they have a lot of dysregulated anger. Do you think they're going to say, oh, I have a restraining order, so I'm just going to listen to that? In many, not all, but in many cases, the narcissistic person is going to basically take the attitude of, you can't tell me what to do. And it's not as though the police are following that person around all the time. If they decide to show up at your house, it's still on you to call law enforcement. So the question's an interesting one because I think it comes down to the severity of the narcissism, the consequences for the narcissistic person. Some narcissistic people will say if, if they're more, more regulated, if they're not as dysregulated, they're going to be able to say, okay, I don't agree with this and I'm going to find a way to get to you if I can, but I'm not going to play this too hard because you can get arrested. If you violate the restraining order, there's far greater leeway to get arrested and people don't necessarily want that on their record. So I think that it depends. It's very, very case dependent, but you have to know the realities. Restraining orders, especially in cases of violence, sometimes increase the likelihood of violence. It doesn't mean you shouldn't get one, but it means you have to be prepared. Ideally, you talk to people who have expertise in this at a domestic violence program in your area. The social workers and folks who work there will often in a much better way be able to walk you through that. But the harassment is bad. And don't always be so sure that the level of harassment you're experiencing is at a sufficient level. I've shared this on lives before. When I had gone through a situation where I really needed a restraining order, I was really given the feedback by a, by a police officer. He's like, I get it. This is terrible, but you don't have enough. And I actually was terrified. It was the most terrifying few weeks for myself and my, my team. And so, but we didn't have enough. And I was like, what the hell is enough then? And because I didn't really know that person, it was a little bit different, but if you know someone, you might have more text messages, emails, but the sheer number you have to show to get it, depending on the kind of harassment it is, it may vary, but I would say definitely work with a DV program near you. And they often have hotlines and whatnot ask because it often varies jurisdiction to jurisdiction. Do we have other questions here? Uh, do narcissistic people recognize other narcissistic people? That's a great question. I think narcissistic people think anybody who doesn't give them their way is narcissistic. So they're thinking you're narcissistic, right? Um, what I think happens is two narcissistic can sometimes kind of circle each other like a pair of junkyard dogs, but they also might be on the same page together. It really comes down to if like, for example, let's say one narcissistic person meets another narcissistic person and this narcissistic person admires this other narcissistic person. Maybe this other narcissistic person is very wealthy or famous or has some form of notoriety. Well, this narcissistic person wants to win over this one because this one has some power. This one might be a little indifferent to this one until they might like the validation they're getting from this one. I don't think in that case there's necessarily recognition. But I do think that there is a, the minute that they feel like, again, it's a junkyard dog thing. It's two alphas and two alphas tend not to like that. They don't like someone else being more powerful. But I think that then it's just going to be that competition. And I don't know that they necessarily recognize them because they don't recognize themselves as narcissistic. So it's not like they've got a good working model. They're more likely to call you who's not narcissistic, narcissistic, because you're not giving in to them. That's what they're more likely to do than be able to pin these patterns on someone else because they don't know them in them. And so they may not recognize them in someone else. I'm noticing my, I get the comment, 
quite a bit that, hey, my narcissistic spouse is watching your content and kind of thinking this is me. And so listen, I can't control who watches YouTube. So um, some people will sort of concoct that theory and think lack of empathy is someone not going along with everything they want. But I think it's it's tricky. I don't know that they always do because I don't think they have a good working model of it. Sometimes they try to win them over. And I think sometimes it's just sort of two alphas sniffing each other out. Other questions? Just wondering, how do you tell younger children why you've gone no contact? Ah, especially if it's a child like the grandparent. This is a difficult one. This is a very, very difficult one. Um, I think that you may not, I would wait for the child to ask, okay? So you're not going to ever tell them without them figuring it out. Now, if uh, and for, to go no contact when a child likes a grandparent, is, is it had to have been a difficult decision. Nobody comes to that lightly. And most people will keep enduring it because of the children. So you, you had very strong reasons. So when the child asks you that, you're certainly not going to gaslight them and say, no, we still see them because you don't. So now the child's going to feel like they're, they're the ones who aren't seeing it clearly. And you can use very, you know, have to hit it developmentally appropriately. Really, the child's four versus 14 versus 10. Those are different kinds of stories you'll tell them. Um, you may initially say, you know, yeah, I know we're not seeing them anymore. And you you might make it, you know, neutral kinds of things like, yeah, we just we just haven't been finding the time for each other. You can, as, you, as they get older, you might, you can use the explanation to like, listen, sometimes people, adult people just don't get along as well as much anymore. So we don't get together as much. And if the child says, but I miss them, you have to listen to that. That's a real experience for your child and empathize with it and hear it and be present with it. It might even bring up feelings in you like grief and guilt. It's so important. Even if we're like, you're thinking, like, oh, you're lucky I'm not making you spend time with them. We don't want to say something like that. And most of us would not, but we want to acknowledge their feeling. What's going to get trickier is depending on how old your kids are, if they get to an age where they're at a point where they could make a more autonomous decision, 16, 17, and say, well, I want to see them. I don't know the level of harm this grandparent is or how you'd feel about that. That's going to be on a case-by-case -case basis. And that would probably require a more robust conversation with a therapist about how best to proceed. Again, I'm assuming that that grandparent wouldn't be significantly harmful to your child, though they may be psychologically harmful. But you're saying younger kids. So I think for now, you don't need to give them a why. You can ignore, not a big why. You can acknowledge it's happened. And then you can say like, yeah, no, it's hard. Because sometimes you make it about grownups. Like, so it's the whole royal grownups instead of just this family. Sometimes grownups kind of go in different directions and we don't get to see each other as much. And, you know, and then they might ask you poignant questions like, well, do you feel sad about that? And you can say, you know, it's not always easy yeah, because people miss people, but we also find out that there's other people we can spend time with. So you let them know you're okay. But what you don't want to do is entirely demonize that grandparent. That's going to confuse them. But you can give them a very vague reason that's developmentally appropriate without lambasting the grandparent, certainly never using words they're not going to understand like narcissism. And, and again, be prepared for the guilt and grief that that's going to bring up for you, but only have this conversation if they ask you about it. If they're not asking about it, don't volunteer. Even if it's like a holiday coming up like Easter and typically you see the grandparent, the grandparent's not coming. If the kid doesn't ask, don't bring it up. Uh, any other questions? Is depression inevitable? I got rid of my therapist because he tells me just forget it. Yeah, no, no, we can't. If it was that simple, I no. We can't just forget it. This is something very real that happened to us and we have to acknowledge it and we have to hold space for it and we have to be with it and we have to feel it. Feeling it is everything. I would say, when you say is depression inevitable, I don't think a major depressive episode is inevitable, but I think sadness is inevitable. I think apathy is inevitable. Um, melancholy, grief, all of those sadness constellation things, I think they're inevitable. You've experienced a loss and it's a big loss. It's a loss of, it's a loss of your story. It's a loss in your life. It's a loss of something you hoped for. There is no just forgetting it. I think actually in therapy school, we're taught like you got to be with the feelings. You've got to feel the feelings. And when you don't feel the feelings, I mean, as a therapist, I'm going to say, and come back now, let's go to that feeling. The 
best part about feelings is if you really feel them and be in them, a new feeling is going to come along soon enough. And when you're in depression, it feels like the new feeling's never going to come, like a cloud that's stuck over the sun on a beach day. It's going to move. It's going to take a while. And maybe your beach day is going to feel kind of ruined, but you have to stay with the feeling. But um, I'm glad you had the courage to say, I don't, yeah, I want, I don't want this. I don't want to just be told to forget it because you do have to work it through. And that's allowing that grief to happen. But the sadness is moderately inevitable because it's grief. That's, I think the grief is the sadness piece of it. And I think it makes sometimes more sense to conceptualize it as grief. Some people, it might be full on depression, but I think the depression and the grief kind of sit together. Do we have any more, we can do about one more question. Um, how can I block my husband from emotionally sucking the life out of me? It's a tough one. We share a child and I'm financially dependent on him. So I can't leave, but I must function. It is the realistic expectations of what this is. This is the radical acceptance. This is who this person is. And yes, there's grief. But the more you see it clearly and you recognize we share a child and there's financial dependence and those are those are the reality of the situation that you then can say, okay, so we're, so th there's me, you who's asking this question, right? A sweet picture with the heart face, hearts on your face, right? There's me. And I, all of us have this sort of psychological well, that's not infinite. And you say, where am I going to put this energy? You're not going to get into it. So the narcissistic folks emotionally suck the life out of us when we eat, when we allow, allow ourselves to engage with them too much. Now they may bait and they're going to get their digs in and that's, it's unpleasant. It's very, very unpleasant and icky, but the more you can cordon that off, he's still going to suck some life of you. There's out of you. There's no version of this where that doesn't happen. But if we can turn the volume on that by creating as much possible disengagement and, and you fostering some other spaces in your life, giving your focus fully to your children. Remember, that the child who has a narcissistic parent, as long as they have a parent who is attuned and present and empathic and aware, it's a very protective feature for your child. So that becomes sort of a meaningful call to like, I got to give my best to my child. I've got to do my best under these circumstances to cultivate or foster one or two other friendships, maybe either find group therapy or individual therapy I can participate in and have that sounding board, find some activity that's meaningful to me, recognize that I'm living with a freight train that runs through my house and makes lots of noise and does suck some of the life out of me. But these other things replete you. So if you view it as like a leaky bucket where some of this life is sort of leaking out of you and he's taking some of it out, but you're filling the top of that bucket at a steadier rate with these other supports, there's still going to be some of that. But what we want is your bucket to not get completely empty. And that's where the radical acceptance and realistic expectations of these are the limitations here. There's nothing I can do to change it. I can have some grief about it, but I also have to be very, I have to ultimately be clear on what I need to do. Your child's not going to be small forever. Times are going to change. The situation's going to shift but we have to meet it where it's at now. And this is where it is now. It's not an ideal answer, but what we're trying to do is make sure your bucket doesn't get completely empty. So you're going to have to fill it some, and some of it's going to spontaneously leak because that's the nature of living with a narcissistic person. But the less you engage, the smaller we can make that hole in the bucket and the smaller we can make that leak. So like I said, I have to jump because I have to be at something in a few minutes where I am, but, and I also have to go to bed because I have to wake up at 3.45 in the morning. But Again, I want to I want to thank you for your brilliant questions. We'll see what happens next week. If it does, then guess what you're going to see? Yammering on it, you Wednesday. I'm going to give you a break for a few days and myself too, so I can kind of replete and have more fresh things to say next week. But again, if you still want to get some of these giveaways, especially that live virtual retreat, and you want to keep getting these raffle entries, please make sure that you um, you if you've bought, if you've pre-ordered the book and you haven't already verified your purchase, please do. I would hate for you to not get credit for that. If you want to order it tonight and get that registered, please do it. Some of you are new to this and may not have. So go ahead and do that. If you want to buy an extra to give to someone or leave in a separate place, this is the time to do it. So again, and then just go ahead and verify that purchase. And then we will keep our other content going and keep you abreast of everything that we are doing. And again, I want to thank you all for your support, your amazing, amazing questions. Folks like Kat Sushi who just keep showing up and, and bringing amazing, thoughtful questions and insights. And um, 
I we'll see what happens. Let's see what happens. It's all so very interesting. No matter what, I'm thrilled about it. Either way, I'm thrilled about getting a chance to do this work and talking to people. So I'm kind of a mess here too. So thank you so much. And um, I hope you have a great rest of your Saturday evening. It's raining where I am, so not so nice. But, um, and then I will, I'm sure we'll be talking soon enough, well, in some way, shape or form, but bless you. Thank you for your support, your attention to this, your amazing questions and your focus on believing that you can heal because you can and keep keep fighting that good fight every day. It will get you to a better place. So bless you all. Thank you. Have a great Saturday night and we will talk soon. So go ahead and get that book too, if you haven't gotten it. Thank you.